thank you very much for that introduction. And thank you, everybody, for coming. Uh, I'm absolutely amazed uh, to see so many people here. Um, I'd like to start off with a special thank you to uh, three people here. Uh, and these are Barbara Beaumont, um, Brian Robinson, and Peter Skeen, who I think is here, but I guess he's not here. There you are. <laughs> um, because at different times in what became my career, um, they gave me a job. And consequently, and completely unknowingly, they have made it possible for me to be here tonight giving this talk. And so I'm deeply indebted to the three of them. But I hasten to add that I remain entirely responsible for anything daft that I come out with tonight. Um, I do want to talk about my job. Um, what is your job is a question that um, I've come to dread because it's extremely hard to answer that in the few seconds that you normally get when a person asks you that, you know, so what do you do? Uh, because if you say I'm an applied linguist, you, you get, you know, a look of, of bafflement and then the next question is, what's applied linguistics? Uh, and so I think I do need to answer that question seeing as it's up there, what is applied linguistics? I'm not going to assume that you all know. So I'm going to take you, first of all, a little trot through uh, what applied linguistics is. And to start with, disappointingly, an applied linguist is not somebody who necessarily knows lots of languages, and, and I don't know lots of languages. Um, and it isn't either the sort of person who uh, is like this. Let's hope this works. Um, that is a theoretical or pure, I love that, <laughs> he's pure, uh, rather than applied. This is Noam Chomsky, um, probably the most famous theoretical linguist ever in the history of the world. And he's standing in front of um, a blackboard on which he's written lots of boxes and numbers and arrows and lines and what looks like algebra. And that isn't applied linguistics. Um, that is theoretical linguistics. I don't want to disrespect it, but I don't do that because I don't really like it. And it, it's full of things like that as well, which I did see for the first time while I was an undergraduate um, and quickly put down. This is to do with the structure of human languages and this, this particular puzzle is some kind of explanation for the role of noun phrases and auxiliary verbs. And, you know, I'm sure it's interesting, but it, it doesn't interest me. Um, here's something else that Chomsky is quite famous, and, and theoretical linguists are quite like doing. This is um, something called optimality theory, which is a linguistic model proposing that um, observed forms of language arise from the interaction between conflicting constraints. And it models grammars as, as <coughs> systems that provide a mapping from input to output. And typically, the input is some underlying representation, invisible to the human eye. And the surface structure is the output. And I'm sure I've lost you already. Uh, <laughs> and me. And you come up with little bits of information like that. Uh, and that is not applied linguistics. And applied linguistics <laughs> in one slide is this. Oh, no, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, that's coming up. I just, I thought I had to put this in um, before I did my one slide summing up applied linguistics. There is a bridge between the two, actually. Uh, this is um, phrase tree structure. Uh, that's Chomsky sleeping under a tree, possibly waiting for an apple to fall on his head. I'm not sure. Um, Colourless green ideas sleep furiously is the most famous sentence in the whole of theoretical linguistics. And it's um, often used as a, an example of how um, form and meaning can be completely disassociated. The meaning of that sentence is nothing, but it is well-formed. It is a well-formed English sentence, even though it doesn't mean anything. And I really wanted to get this one in because um, 
because, because of John. I found this on the internet. John, that's for you. Uh, <laughs> and this is a sentence broken down into its constituent parts, its constituent little phrases which are embedded inside each other. An applied linguist isn't terribly interested in that because it's a made-up sentence, but might be interested in a variant on that, which would be, John has lost his marbles because the form has stayed the same, but it's basically the structure of the noun phrase and verb phrase, etc. But the meaning has become figurative, and that's really interesting. That's applied linguistics. Uh, this is, uh, I, mean, oh, I can't even be bothered to tell you about that one, never mind. Uh, that's the slide. That's the slide. That's applied linguistics, because what's missing from theoretical linguistics, and I don't wish to disrespect them, I really don't, so I'm not clever enough to do any of that, but what's missing um, are people. Uh, people, where you have people, you have language. Uh, if you have people and no language, something very bizarre is going on. Um, something horrible has probably happened. Where there are people, there is language. They're speaking it, they're listening to it, they're reading it, they're writing it, they're dealing with it. Um, and applied linguistics looks at that kind of language. There are loads and loads of branches of applied linguistics, and I'm just going to talk very briefly about a few. That one looks a bit scary. This is corpus linguistics. I don't think you can see that very well, but corpus linguistics is the analysis of enormous samples of language produced by people, not thought up, like colourless, green ideas, sleep few of you. So it's what people produce, enormous samples, and we are talking, you know, millions of examples of speech or writing, can be put to a computer analysis that will pick out patterns which an individual human brain would not be able to see. And I've got up here an example of something that you may never have thought of before, but you do know if, you're speaking, if you speak English, which is that the word recommend collocates with strongly, and sometimes with highly, but mostly with strongly. So if you ever use strongly with the word recommend, and you do, um, it's because it's what everybody else is doing. Here's another one. Uh, oh, I was going to ask you, that's what I've given away. I was going to ask you what you thought was collocated with accessible, and you would all have said all manner of things, but the answer is actually the word easily. So that, that's corpus linguistics. Another, another part of linguistics is phonetics and phonology. You're basically really interested in the human vocal tract. You've all got one of those, uh, and it works incredibly fast to produce streams of phonemes at a rate of knots without you getting tired. You don't ever go home at the end of a, a long day saying, my vocal tract is worn out, I can't talk anymore. Um, and... Uh, they look at the mechanics of the workings of the vocal tracts and how they enable humans to speak, for example. Uh, another branch of it looks at humans who can't speak because they've been born with a cleft palate or a hair lip. This is a very serious disability in a child. It makes the articulation of speech impossible without surgery. One in 700 babies is born with a defect to their vocal tract. Um, and if you're in a rich country, it's repairable. And I thought you'd all be cheered up by <coughs> this little five-year-old who's had his surgery and is now having therapy to learn how to use his repaired vocal tract. So this is a really nice area of applied linguistics. It's extremely important and solves an awful lot of horrible human problems. Language typology, there are people doing that. Wherever there are humans, there is language. If you come across this human, as you might have done if you'd been exploring in the Papua New Guinea highlands um, 30 or 40 years ago, you might have come across somebody who was from a tribe that had had no contact with other humans for many thousands of years, possibly, and whose language was therefore unrelated and very... Uh, it's called... Uh, oh, I've forgotten what it's called now. Michael will tell me. Uh, a language which has no relatives, never mind, uh, forget that. Um, and people will go in wanting to describe it, wanting to describe how that language solves the problems that all human uh, languages do, how to relate um, thought to speech. 
Are the people look at the relationships between families, these are all of the Indo-European family of languages, looking at how they are related to each other in terms of prepositions and word order. Even more broadly, it's possible other applied linguists have done a huge amount of research and established that there are four main language families in the world. You've got the blue one, the Indo-European. The green one in Africa is the Bantu language family. The red one, the Polynesian family. And there's an Uto aztecan family in North and Central America. And so um, looking at how languages are typologically similar or dissimilar gives you a lot of information about human migrations, possibly, of very, very many thousands of years ago. It might even lead you into this branch of applied linguistics. I think this is the best Christmas card I've ever seen. I, I, I do think they're walking through snow. It's very loving. Uh, they're not human. They're early hominids. Um, is he saying anything to her? It looks like he is. Um, uh, there's a lot of speculation here. Did these early forms of humans uh, have language? It's largely speculative, and it's perhaps a tiny bit pointless, but it's nevertheless quite interesting. Something more useful is forensic linguistics. Every single person has an idiolect, that is to say their language is peculiar to themselves. In, for example, their favorite phrasings, their choice of syntactic structures, um, things they don't say, uh, expressions they don't use. Uh, and this gives us the possibility of this kind of investigation. Julie Turner went missing in 2005 and later texted her family, telling them she was fine. But her family were suspicious, and so were the police. They turned over her texts, both the ones from before she went missing and the ones after she went missing. And a, a forensic linguist uh, compared the two and found they were very different. And uh, in fact, they were very similar to the idiolect of some chap whose name I can't remember, who the police suspected of being involved in her disappearance. And indeed, that was proved, and he is now serving life in prison. Now, I think if we had one of those working for us at St Mary's, we'd have in the REF just about the best case study you could possibly have. I've put someone in jail. That's the impact. <laughs> That's the impact of my research. Or, you know, possibly I've saved someone from the electric chair uh, by proving that he couldn't have written that um, confession because it wasn't his idiolect. Um, more trivially, did he write his plays or was it loads of different people contributing to his plays? Um, forensic linguistics has methods uh, to... Uh, sort of ferret out how much of Henry VIII did Shakespeare write, etc. Um, I'm going to skip over the next slide because it takes time. Historical linguistics takes the diachronic view. What was language like in the day of Shakespeare? Chaucer, the Beowulf poet. Uh, how did Latin change gradually into French over the course of a thousand years or so? Um, so it's Chaucer, Middle English. And a thousand years ago, English looked like that, if it was written down. Uh, that was their favourite font uh, at the time. And it sounded like this. And if you know Luke, chapter 2, verse 7, as I'm sure you do, and it is quite seasonal. Uh, this says, And heo kenda hier from Canada and sunu, and hina mid chid clatham be wand, and hina on bin a laid, for them the he navdan room on kumana hoose. Right. Good. Okay. <laughs> uh, there's probably one word there. Well, there's two. There's the word and, that's quite easy. And there's the word room. And then the rest of it's a bit mysterious. But I might come back to that. Um, the point is, that's what historical linguists do. Coming up to the present day, sociolinguistics is the study not just of accents and dialect, but of group variation across class, ethnicity, gender, geographical regions, the relationship of language to power, which is a really important area. Power is exercised in and opposed through language. Language is highly political. It's not just some bizarre hobby that linguists have, applied linguists have. It's highly political, and it can get you into trouble big time. 
On the left, Jordan Blackshaw, age 20, created an event called Smash Down Northwich Town. Unfortunately, he did that in August when the rest of the country was going up in flames and he was arrested. On the right, Perry Sutcliffe Keenan, age 22, caused um, uh, a wave of panic in Warrington by posting a link to, on his Facebook to a, uh, a page called The Warrington Riots. Nothing happened in Northwich, nothing happened in Warrington. It was very peaceful and quiet. There wasn't a single rioter, including them. But they both got four years in jail for that linguistic act. <laughs> he needs no introduction. Last week, when some of us were out there on the picket line defending our pensions, he said, frankly, I'd have them all shot. I would take them outside and execute them in front of their families. I mean, how dare they go on strike when they have these guilt edge pensions that are going to be guaranteed while the rest of us have to work for a living? Well, that was apparently a joke. That, that was... No, oh, sorry, hang on. That was a crime. <coughs> and that was a joke. What does language mean and who gets to say what it means? I know. Who gets to say that was a joke? And so he's fine, he's kept his job. Who gets to say what that link on a Facebook meant and why they are in prison? Obviously, it's a political act. And there are linguists, applied linguists, on that case. Social linguistics is very interested in the exercise of power through language. When is a joke a crime? And when is it just a bit of fun? Right. Engage your brain before you say anything is probably something which Jeremy Clarkson ought to have on a shirt somewhere. Um, Neurolinguistics is the study of the anatomy of the brain in relation to language, um, language use. And modern research toys like um, magnetic... Uh, I, I haven't understand resonance imaging and positron electron tomography, uh, to name but two, can give you images of brain activity when a person is reading or speaking or writing or listening to language as opposed to not doing any of those things. Um, it can also give you a view into a damaged brain, a brain which has been damaged through trauma of some kind, and so that the person cannot produce or understand language. And all that is extremely interesting. Developmental psycholinguistics is a sort of subset of that. It looks at children's ability to learn language. There they are, which is phenomenal. Um, they can do it like they'll never be able to do it again in the rest of their lives, and that's a, a fantastic puzzle for us. Uh, let me just, yes. This is a little group of four-year-olds. They cannot make themselves a sandwich, they certainly can't tie their shoes or be allowed to go out down the corner shop and buy a newspaper. They can't do any of those things, but they can speak, and they can speak a lot, and they can speak grammatically. They have a big vocabulary. In fact, they're only two years away from having pretty much finished language acquisition. Right? How is that possible? It's a study that developmental psycholinguistics really likes to ask. I'm not in that. I, I'm in this uh, this is my field, second language acquisition, and it looks at how humans develop knowledge of a language uh, with, uh, after childhood, and, uh, and the unhappy truth that this is almost always not nearly as well as they could before their childhood ended. And so the sorts of questions that second language acquisition is asking is, what, why, how, what's it got to do with motivation, age, um, personality? Uh, quality of instruction, cognitive ability, or innate endowments. Well, more of that later, perhaps. Uh, I've just brought that in. Uh, this is the um, ultimate, uh, well, this is your score in an English language test plotted against your uh, age at which you started, and it looks like you've just jumped off a cliff and bounced onto some concrete underneath. There's a catastrophic decline it sets in, according to that particular one, when you're seven. And it's by the time you're 12, it's picked up speed. And it hasn't reached its terminal velocity, even at that age. Like that. Well, 
almost us. This is nothing to do with linguistics, but it claims it is. I thought to put it in. Um, they're not almost us. They are absolutely millions of years away from us. And the studies which try to show that they are almost us are frankly risible. Because the only thing they ever show is that apes will do anything at all, include, including pretending to use human language for peanut or piece of fruit or chocolate biscuit. Um, and that's something which um, babies don't. The problem with babies and humans is this one. You don't have to reward them to get them to talk. You have to reward them to get them to shut up. <laughs> right? You never have to encourage your child to say anything by offering it a peanut or a chocolate biscuit, unless you are training them in pragmatic dimensions of language politeness, like saying please, thank you, and thank you for having me, and things like that. So um, I just wanted to pause here, uh, go slightly off course, and there are rules um, that we all absorb as we grow up about when to be quiet, when you're allowed to speak. And I was just basically going to point out the fact that you all know that at the moment you can't say anything because it's my go. <laughs> <laughs> and sort of putting your hand up and asking a question now is not appropriate. You can ask them at the end, but you can't do it now. And if you want to talk to each other, you have to do it quietly so that I don't look at you <laughs> like that. Um, but what would happen if your phone rang? And I'm not asking that because I want you now to turn your phone off. It's not because of a trick like that. It's that uh, what seems to happen in the modern world is with this technology, when your phone rings, the phone becomes the most important thing of all linguistically. And it gets answered. It butts in. The phone butts in all the time. And it breaks all of the rules. You shouldn't butt in. You should politely inquire if you can stop speaking to somebody and attend to something else. But everybody seems to think your phone rings, that's the most important linguistic thing. Now, answer that phone. So, um, I'm not asking you to turn your phone off. I'm just saying I think I need that T-shirt when I am in a tutorial. Uh, <laughs> right, I should maybe get one of those. Pragmatics covers the study of the non-compositional nature of language. In other words, that meaning is frequently not recoverable from the sum of its parts. Uh, language is figurative. I think I've got a slide about that. Yes, here you are. It's figurative. Meanings are implied rather than stated boldly. And there will always be um, <laughs> problems for uh, extraterrestrial beings who don't know that. Uh, an extraterrestrial being who replies to the question he's just been asked there with a why, yes, thank you, I would like a knuckle sandwich hasn't understood language at all and he's about to get beaten up. So it is quite important. And the problem with that invader from outer space is he's been reading that man's book and not that man's book, right? <laughs> The danger of um, computers taking over the world is lo in a lot of science fiction that computers will start speaking, you know, get more intelligent. No, they won't. We will always be able to beat them at language, always, because we know how to imply, we know how to suggest without saying things on the surface. We are much cleverer. Thank goodness. I think that's, I, hope, I hope you think that's quite a comfort in this day and age. Now, all the above areas of blood linguistics have something terribly important in common, and this is the subject, really, of my talk tonight. They are evidence-based. Again, I don't wish to disrespect this chap here. It's not to say that Chomsky and generative linguistics is not interested in evidence, because they are. In fact, they are so interested in evidence, they've spent the last 50 years looking for evidence for the... <laughs> existence um, of a universal human grammar, which is at the heart of generative um, um, linguistics. They haven't come up with anything substantial, uh, uh, and I think that's a very entrenched position, but I'm going to talk about that a bit later on. But um, 
the fact is, applied linguistics is an evidence-based discipline, and we think we get a very raw deal. If we were from any other discipline that is evidence-based, which is any other science at all, I mean, you can think of astronomy, epidemiology, particle physics, uh, you know, brain surgery, or whatever, um, that in itself should be good enough when you tell somebody, what do you do? Oh, I'm an oncologist, I'm a particle physicist, I'm an astronomer. That should be good enough. People will be willing to concede that they don't know anything about your subject, and so that you probably are expert, and they will bow to your greater wisdom. You will not say something like, yeah, well, I know you think that nothing can move faster than the speed of light, but I don't think so. And so I'm just not going to listen to anything you have to say. An applied linguist doesn't get that kind of concession at all. Language is so much part of our daily lives that I think people think it must be obvious to everybody how it works, that their own experience counts for a great deal. Even in the face of evidence, they don't want to give up their opinion, they don't want to give up their assertions, they don't want to give up what they think is obviously common sense. Now, what I'm going to do now, I hope, with this technology, is show you something which is not a proof of my title, but an emblem for it, right? So not a proof. I want you to hold on to that. It's not a proof, but it's quite good fun, and it is emblematic. And it requires you to listen. I've deliberately chosen this link to be in Japanese so that you won't be distracted by what these people are saying, but you should be able to understand what they're doing. Right, now, fingers crossed. I don't believe it is eh, like that. That's what happened there. Um, so I hope you followed that. <laughs> what they were listening to was exactly the same loop of sound. It was always ba, 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 ba. But when they were looking at the man's mouth, it was a film of him saying another sound. He was actually saying da. Or ga, you can't really tell, but I thought it was a da. And even when they're told that what they're listening to is a ba, their brain will tell them that what they're looking at is much more convincing, and it is actually not that sound. So you don't, I'll, just, I'll just go on with this here. I've played the rest of it. What you have to bear in mind is when you can't see the person's mouth, you will hear the sound as ba. When you can see the person's mouth, you will hear it as da, even though I've told you, and it's true, there isn't any difference. It's always the same sound.
that's what happened. Uh, I have not been able to convince myself that that sound doesn't change, unless you shut your eyes, and then you hear that it, it doesn't change. Um, the information of your eyes is too hard for you to override. Even when it's shut, if anybody wants to play with it, just put McGurk effect, the McGurk effect into YouTube. There's loads of them. There's loads of them. Um, so what's going on here is, although you might understand that I am telling you the truth, that it is always the same sound, and even though you may understand that because when you shut your eyes, you know it's always the same sound, you can't believe it. You can't believe it. There's no one who could. There's a man who's been researching this effect for 15 years, still can't believe it. He's still not able to override. Though this is an emblem for my talk. And also uh, an excuse to look at something which is quite amusing. No matter how good our evidence is that things in language are the way they are, no matter how much evidence we muster to explain aspects of language to people, if we get in the way of their long-held beliefs, they don't believe you. They can't believe you. It's extremely difficult to persuade the majority of people that evidence for matters linguistic is much more powerful than anecdote, it's much more powerful than opinion, it's much more powerful than the horrible idea of common sense. Common sense is a stupid guide to reality. <laughs> common sense tells you the sun moves across the sky during the course of the day, and of course it doesn't, but common sense will tell you, yes, it does, I saw it, you know, I, I'm not moving, I know I'm not moving. So let me bring up here next some um, things that might challenge what you've always thought. There are no primitive languages. You might have thought, oh, yes, there are. There are sophisticated languages. Of what if I tell you there are none? What if I tell you that everyone speaks grammatically? Everyone. You might not believe that because you were always told by your teachers at school that there were people that didn't speak grammatically and there were very bad people that needed to be eradicated. <laughs> what if I tell you that English is not a global language because of its innate linguistic superiority? No, it's not. It's not because it's top language. What if I told you to calm down because English is not going down the toilet? It's not in decline, as you might think. You might be old enough. You have to be a certain age before you start believing that, but some of you are there. Uh, what if I told you that slang or texting, they are doing nothing to the standard of the English language at all? They're not. And, sorry, Philip, but what if I told you that your dog hasn't learned English? <laughs> <laughs> Applied linguistics has got evidence for all of these things in spades, tons, bucketfuls of it. There is nothing to support uh, the opposite opinion, which is what you find in the ordinary world outside of, uh, of applied linguistics. And that kind of thing is met with huge hostility. <laughs> huge hostility. We're accused of damaging the language, of having some horrible, laissez-faire, probably left-wing uh, attitudes that will mean the end of children speaking properly, the death of language standards, and we're seeing just be dribbling and grunting <laughs> rather than using language. Now, I just want to run through this. This guy may well come from a culture which has a Stone Age primitive technology, but his language isn't primitive. His language is as complex as any other human language and would take you a very long time to learn. It's not primitive. It doesn't just have a few words, you know, and a few grunts and a few signs. And <laughs> she does actually speak grammatically. And if I had a whiteboard, I'd draw you the tree. I mean, she, yeah, she doesn't speak a lot of sense. She isn't, she's not even a girl. It's a man dressed <laughs> up. Uh, um, uh, there's an awful lot of nonsense, but it's grammatical. And I, you know, it is. I'm sorry, because if it weren't, there would be no joke. You wouldn't be able to understand a word she was saying. But it is grammatical. Um, English is a global language, not because it's the best language, because thanks to historical accidents, there was a British Empire that was succeeded by an American Empire, and the language was English, and it got taken all over the place. And it makes the French fume. Because, it, you know, they would have got in first if they had been able to. And then we'd always speak in French as a global language. 
I don't think you can see this, and I'm sorry I couldn't make it any bigger, and I couldn't find anything better. Um, this is a really interesting uh, graph. I mean, you can see the, at the top it says 65,000 years ago people left Africa. Um, and we don't know how long they'd stayed there before they left. It probably you know, could be another 20, 50,000 years that humans were in Africa before they broke out. Um, but what this is saying is uh, they left Africa, some of them came into Europe. By 5,000 years ago, uh, 5,000 BC, there was a group of them in uh, southern Russia, northern uh, Turkey, uh, speaking a language which we call Proto-Indo-European. Um, by 1000 BC, a group of them were sitting offshore <laughs> uh, to the British Isles, and then they invaded. 500 AD, they were here, and we can start calling their language English. And then, of course, the Vikings invaded in the 8th and 9th centuries, and then we had the Norman Conquest, uh, which helped to bring about uh, the, the variety of English called Middle English, and then we have the Renaissance, and then we have Shakespeare in English. And in basically, then we have 2012, the, the dialect I'm speaking to you now. Um, in order to think that English is in decline, you've got to believe, and this is a stupid position, that for the last 95,000 years, this language has been changing until it's delivered the one I'm speaking now. And then any further changes are some kind of ghastly falling off of standards. If you look at it diachronically like this, we're just part of an inevitable movement of change. It's neither good nor bad. It's completely neutral. Now, you can say that over and over and over and over again, and you can explain it, and you'll still get people saying no, but it's being ruined. It's being ruined by things like this. This is a real bogey uh, of a lot of people. But, you know, abbreviations are part of our language heritage. And we see them, we know them, we're not afraid of them, we don't think they're bad, but they're all <coughs> doing the same job of making writing faster. And if you are chipping writing on a stone tablet, that's really good. And if you are trying to write on a piece of incredibly expensive vellum, that's also very good. And if you're trying to do a, whoops, sorry, a message in a little tiny text box like that, it's the only way to go. If you can read this, what's the problem is a perfectly well-formed English sentence, which has been tapped out by somebody who does know English and can spell it, because if you can't, you can't work out that. You can't work it out if you don't know how to spell. So calm down, dear. And here is one for Philip especially. What we say to dogs and what they hear. <laughs> the dog knows you're cross. It knows you're pointing at it, your voice is raised. It does know you're cross, and it doesn't know why. And it's not going to be able to think to itself, well, I'd better stay out of the garbage in the future because obviously I'm going to be in major trouble. <laughs> <coughs> However, the resistance, I just need to say this, the resistance to things like this is so deep, it's so pervasive, that Deborah Cameron in her book, Verbal Hygiene, has said, it's just hopeless, everybody give up. We are never going to win the argument here with the human race because there's some deep-seated psychological inability <laughs> to accept that the way we speak isn't the only way that speech can be done, that we're afraid of it changing because it's undermining something which is extremely important to us, and therefore we should all give up. Now, I'm going to say in my talk tonight, I don't want to give up. I don't want to throw in the towel and say, yeah, well, we know that texting isn't ruining English, uh, um, but nobody is going to believe us. I want to say we know it's not ruining English, and people should start believing us. Even though, and Deborah Cameron makes this point as well, we get accused of saying, well, your problem with applied linguistics is you just don't like rules. 
you just think anything is all right. And I want to say here tonight, there's nobody who likes a grammar rule more than an applied linguist. We love them. They're our bread and butter. We're interested in them to such an extent that we do research projects into, into them to see whether particular grammatical rules are still current or never current or have, are ceasing to be current or whether um, you know, they've been acquired by a learner or not acquired by a learner. We're not in the business of lambasting people for not using rules that never existed except in the minds of pedants. Now... I'm going to bring up next <laughs> something that could go on for a very, very long time. So I've just picked my favourite targets. A few notes about them here. The Hall of Shame. He's led off by... <laughs> she thinks the only thing that can rescue English is the teaching of Latin. I'm all for the teaching of Latin, but it's not going to do anything about English. It is actually an a different language. <laughs> Simon Heffer has written an utterly ignorant and completely stupid blustering book called Strictly English, insisting on a return to rules of grammar which he thinks existed in the past when they didn't and haven't or haven't done since the 17th century. He's a complete buffoon. Uh, oh dear, I'm being recorded. No, he's not, allegedly. <laughs> uh, he strongly insists on things like the plural of cappuccino is cappuccini. <laughs> and of course it's not, unless you're speaking Italian when it is, but that's not what he means. Uh, he's also very keen on people starting to say, even though it be not raining, I shall go for a walk. You know, <laughs> what a nutter. Uh, I'm afraid His Royal Highness doesn't approve of new words. It's all getting a bit of a mess, he said. New words must be stopped. Uh, I would like to point out to His Royal Highness all words were new at some point. And if I can take you back to the 11th century version of Luke, um, if we translated that into modern English, they pretty much many of them would be completely new. I always like to tell him the word prince is a new word for some people. It was a new word um, around about the 12th century or so. It replaced the English word atheling. So there. <laughs> he's too young for this, but he sees language doom in texting and he's written about it on his blog. Uh, Beryl Bainbridge is unfortunately no longer with us, but while she was alive, she wished to kill off regional accents because she thought they were horribly ugly and she wanted compulsory elocution lessons in schools. Christopher Hitchens doesn't like the use of as, as a conjunction. Uh, no, he does. He doesn't like like as a conjunction, sorry. He doesn't like things like, it tastes good like a cigarette should. His bad English, it should be, it tastes good as a cigarette should. And, and he says that if we can just turn the clock back and get people to properly use as and like, and not improperly, everybody will start speaking very much more sense. Of course, of course, that's not true. You can speak complete rubbish grammatically. And most people do, let's face it. It doesn't guarantee you're going to say anything sensible. John Humphreys, a journalist famous for showing uh, publicly how stupid he thinks everybody is. He's written two books full of his own pet hates about the way language is used today. Two! He's written two of them. <laughs> This person is a retired reader in genetics and therefore completely qualified to run the Queen's English Society, which is determined to stop English changing in ways that the Queen's English Society deems to be bad. They are fighting to resurrect the subjunctive. <laughs> Their pet hate is, if I was you. And there's an entire mass of stuff on their website about that. Gerald Warner is a professional social critic and journalist and a smug polemicist. Uh, he thinks we need an academy of English to save our beautiful language. He thinks it's been left to fend for itself at a time when it is under unprecedented attack from all quarters. And I would just like to say to him, Gerald, did you know that in the 9th and 12th centuries, English lost a huge amount of its verb morphology? Um, 
after the 12th century lost a massive amount of its native vocabulary to French borrowings. And then in the 14th century, sorry, the 16th and 17th centuries was inundated by a tidal wave of Latin and Greek. Nothing like that is happening now. And of course, he'd approve of all those changes. He'd say, oh, they're good, you know, but the new ones are bad. Martin Estinel is director of the Academy of English, a self-appointed panel of guardians whose avowed aim is to set down the standards of what is proper English and try to make everybody obey. Uh, I'd like to quote Samuel Johnson from the 18th century when such a proposal was first mooted. The British would only care about the rules handed down by an academy in order to make sure that they disobeyed them at every opportunity. <laughs> well said, that man. He's quite right. And finally, someone who I think is quite funny. Uh, except here. He worries about rampant language change. If innovation continues unchecked, the language will fragment into thousands of mutually incomprehensible dialects. Well, no, it won't. Uh, no, sorry. No, it won't. <laughs> no, it won't. Don't worry, David. It won't. It's fine. It hasn't. It's had, had 95,000 years of not doing that, so don't worry about it. Um, and this, I'd have to put her up. She has conversations with that gorilla about that gorilla's early life in rainforests in West Africa and how traumatic it was when she was captured. And they're, they're currently discussing what to do about the fact that the gorilla wants to have a baby, but the boyfriend gorilla doesn't appear to be particularly interested <laughs> in that. You're a maniac. Right, I'm just going to move on. So here we go. <laughs> This is the question in a polylingual answer. Does it matter? Yes, I'm going to say it does really matter because, left to themselves, these language hall of shamers can do an awful lot of damage. An awful lot of damage. And I'm going to give you two examples of this. So, why I think that it's important to try to fight back. Boris Johnson, Mayor of London, commissioned a paper from the Central Centre for Policy Studies here. It's called. You can't see that there. It's called. So why can't they read? He didn't commission an applied linguist, which he should have done. Uh, he commissioned somebody who just doesn't have any training in linguistics. Uh, it should have been a considered and measured survey of the evidence for the li illiteracy rates in London, which is an important topic. But instead of that, it's an ignorant rant in favour of her preferred methodology for the teaching of reading, which is synthetic phonics. That's what she thinks is the answer. Her reasons uh, for this are extremely poorly argued. The entire document is written by anecdote of some ghastly situation for which there is no other evidence at all, followed by another anecdote for the solution. So here I'm just going to read you something which, if it was a student paper, would probably get something like a 31, something like that from me. Uh, she says here, Unfortunately, many teachers themselves victims of a poor state education have a weak grasp of spelling and syntax. There's an assertion. No, for which we have no evidence, a teaching assistant at a large London primary school, here comes the anecdote, tells me that she has, on a number of occasions, observed teachers writing wrongly spelled words and grammatically incorrect sentences on the board. I arrest my case, she says, you see. It's shocking. Uh, she doesn't say what a number of occasions means. Maybe it was once. She doesn't even say what the grammatically incorrect sentence was. Maybe someone wrote something without a subjunctive or something like that. What's the problem with schools? This is what she says. Too much paperwork, OK? Noisy classrooms, talking in corridors, disruptive and violent behaviour, truancy, child-centred learning, <laughs> not standing in line, <coughs> or curriculum loaded with stuff. That's her word. Stuff, like personal health and social education. Teachers can't write grammatically, OK? They can't spell. The children sit in groups. Shocker. <laughs> they don't correct writing errors, which is a moral failure. <laughs> and worst of all, they do whole word recognition methodology. 
She, she quotes also very favourably, uh, because this is the villain, that's the big villain, that's why it's in capital letters. It's a whole word recognition methodology for teaching of reading. No wonder they can't learn to read. She quotes admiringly a study done in West Dunbartonshire in 1997, over 10 years, into trying to improve reading. And you can see why, because it was the worst place in the entire country for literacy, with only 28% of its children leaving primary school functionally literate. I mean, that's awful. That's really terrible. So they did a 10-year project, and at the end of it, their literacy rates were right up here. And she says, phonics. It's synthetic phonics. Synthetic phonics. That's why they did so well. And the reason I would give this a 31, maybe not, maybe a 28 possibly, is that she's missing the obvious problem with the evidence here. They didn't just do synthetic phonics, they did lots of other stuff. They did things like bringing the parents in so that the parents could see the importance of reading with their children. They were in partnership with local libraries so that they had reading spaces. They invested hugely in books. They made the whole thing a community project, and literacy rates went up. So we don't know what did it. We don't know whether it was synthetic phonics. We don't know whether it was whole We don't know. And to know, and I'm not going to say that I will do this research, but it could be done. You could just have to isolate the methodology from all the other variables. And you'd have whole word recognition, you'd have synthetic phonics, and you'd have another one which is doing a mixture of the two. And you'd follow them for a long years. If you could just control all the other things as well, you might come up with an answer as to what's the best way to teach reading. This is my prediction. Um, they all work. But the combination at least varies the diet. So maybe that's the best way to go, and that is actually what a lot of schools do. Sadly, that's not going to suit a Department of Education that's determined to blame left-wing teachers for resisting synthetic phonics and causing a crisis in literacy that can only be cured by abandoning whole word recognition completely. Right? Now, if there is an answer to this problem, it needs to be honest, open-minded, applied linguists' research. It has to be done that way. They have to be done by people with knowledge of the acquisition of reading and no investment in the answer. We just want to find the answer. And I, I want to say also how horrible it was for St Mary's uh, School of Education, who otherwise had a brilliant um, quality assurance rating of like five star, five star, five star, except for one thing, they didn't do enough synthetic phonics and they got marked down. And that's just outrageous. And it's damaging, and it's wrong, and they should have had an applied linguist. Not me, but someone like me. Case two. Michael Gove, director of, what's he called? Secretary of State for Education and Training and something else. I don't know what his title is. He thinks... This is a big idea. We should introduce second languages into primary schools from the age of five. He said it's a slam dunk, which I think is what it means. Was it's an American expression? I don't know why he's using that, but it means that it, it's obvious. It's obvious. Don't have it in secondary school. Start at five. Now, why didn't this person ask an applied linguist before opening his mouth? Why did he say that? It's not good enough to descend upon primary schools and say, right, second languages in the curriculum, year two, begin now, immediately. And then to claim they're all going to be, this is his, you know, everybody is going to be very much better at learning languages because we start earlier and more intelligent. And he says, it's literally the case literally the case, not, you know, the normal way he uses this word, is literally the case that learning languages makes you smarter, the neural networks in the brain strengthen as a result of language learning. Well, having strong neural pathways doesn't mean you're going to be more intelligent. It just means you're going to have stronger neural pathways. The two things are not the same. Not the same. 
earlier, if you'd asked an applied linguist, he would have got this answer. Earlier is not necessarily better for classroom language teaching. Children age five will learn language very easily if they're in an immersion setting, if it's all day, not half an hour on a Thursday afternoon and another half an hour on a Tuesday morning. They're very good at picking up languages while they're doing something else, but they're not very good at responding to a 30-minute class where language teaching is the object. In fact, they're hopeless at that kind of thing. You can't start at five unless, Mr Gove, you are going to invest the billions of pounds necessary to change all of our schools into immersion settings for French or Italian or Spanish or whatever, which presumably in this climate you're not going to be doing. It's very hard for me to imagine what you could do with a class of five-year-olds. I'm a very experienced language teacher. I've never had a class of five-year-olds. I don't know what I would do. Um, you need specialist materials. You need specialist training. It's going to take a lot of money and there isn't any money on the table. All you've said is, we'll just make the school day longer. That's all you've said. Um, worse, he's ignoring the fact that huge numbers of children are already bilingual when they come to school. There are hundreds of home languages spoken by children in London schools. Why don't we value that? Why do we say we want you to learn French? It's very rare to see a school valuing the cultural language of their children, the one they speak at home. It's often seen, this is a problem, they speak that language at home, this is a problem, we have to get them extra English in school. So here's where I would take issue with um, Deborah Cameron. And maybe I'm just being incredibly optimistic and a bit mad. But I think if we had more emphasis on language as a subject in school, a subject of inquiry, a subject of wonder, a subject that's interesting, so that we introduce children to the amazing nature of language variation, from formal written English to informal local dialect, not as informal local dialect bad, written English good, but as both good but different, different in interesting ways. What if we help them to appreciate their home languages as something which was actually really interesting. The way your home language is structured, the way English is structured, and how different they are. We might be able to head off the knee-jerk attitude that so many of our fellow citizens have when it comes to viewing standard English as best and non-standard English as substandard English. Standard English, the province of the smart, the elite, the correct, and not of hopeless, ordinary people with their comical local dialects. If Go <coughs> could listen to the messages coming from applied linguistics saying, you know, you can teach an awful lot of this stuff in a primary school, he might not have better policies, but they would be less terrible, less pointless. And maybe we would, in 15 years' time, have an audience of people who didn't think that language was going down the drain, that dogs could speak English, that English was the best language because we're the best people, the top language, no one's got such a lovely language as we've got, etc., etc. And in addition, I just want to say, while we've got him listening to me, one really good thing we could do for foreign language teaching in this country is take the exam away from it. The washback effect of GCSEs is baleful in all subjects, but it's particularly baleful in language. Basically, what pupils do is they get trained to display knowledge in an exam. And that's because the exam is the most important thing. Get a C, get a B, get an A. I don't think they are learning a language in order to be able to use it. They're learning a language in order to be able to stuff another GCSE on their certificate. And that's a problem. Take the exam away. 
Maybe you wouldn't get as many people signing up for it, but they'd be getting a different experience in the classroom. This is where I'll finish where I started. In case you think that applied linguists are rather smug at telling off other people for not uh, listening to evidence, I do want to say that some of us do sit in entrenched positions that are difficult to get out of. And this is one. This is one of them. 50 years of looking for evidence for a universal grammar based on the argument that it isn't possible for a child to acquire knowledge of its first language from experience alone. That it has to be a genetically endowed knowledge that gives human children the toolkit they need to break into whichever human language it is they're exposed to. It's a creationist position. It can be no other way. It's just too wonderful. It has to be genetically endowed. Now, I think that is coming to the end of its life. It is an entrenched position. We might have to wait until he's retired. We might have to wait until he's not around anymore before it's possible to say out loud, of course you know there's a lot of work in emergentism that will explain child language acquisition in a much more parsimonious and obvious way. And I'm ending by saying that some enterprising applied linguist called Deb Roy has done something which our ethics committee would not have allowed him to do. He filled his house with cameras and microphones from the moment his little boy was born, and he has recorded every word said to that child and by that child for two years. And he's got the most ghastly job of analysing all of that. <laughs> uh, unbelievable. But he will, at the end of it, have evidence which, it seems to me, will knock on the head forever the poverty of the stimulus idea, and here I'm just speaking to the few of you who are my fellow applied linguists, the poverty of the stimulus idea that children don't hear enough high-quality language for them to be able to learn the rules of it. Well, this is someone who said, that's an empirical question, and I'm going to get the data. And he has the data, and maybe in 20 years' time he will have, <laughs> he will have analysed it. Uh, and I hope so. And um, I'm ending apologising to Noam Chomsky for making him the Aunt Sally here. Um, but I do think he's a wonderful, wonderful theoretical linguist, and uh, his contribution to linguistics will live in memory forever. Um, but it's coming to an end as I am as well. Thank you.